the chilling realm of dormant wars. Are you ready to meet the foolish Eduardo? Unlock the secrets of his dreadful fate and discover the horrors that lurk within his dorm room. My freshman year, I walked into my room to find my new roommate screaming at his father in the middle of the room. Despite his yelling about not wanting to go, he blamed his mom for writing his college essay and filling out the application. His father called my new roommate an ungrateful piece of SH asterisk T and threatened to beat him. The moment they realized I was in the room, they pretended like nothing had happened, shook my hand, and introduced themselves. Thank goodness, my parents hadn't come in with me, so they didn't have to see this. After my parents helped me set up in the room, they talked about how proud they were of us. My new roommate's father kept saying things like, I'm not supporting a failure. My parents thought my new roommate, Eduardo, was joking. He told me every day he hated school, would never walk to class, and drank in his room all day. He used to yell at everyone, party all night, and be a jerk in general. He used to watch VH1 until 4am every night with the volume turned up so loud you couldn't hear him. I asked him to turn it down because I couldn't hear myself think. When I said he'd wrestle me, he said he'd do it. It turns out he's serious. I declined his offer and went to bed when he told me to turn down Brett Michaels Rock of Love show. It was the next day that he called to ask his mom for help and she agreed. She never showed up and he lost his mind. His TV was punched, his Guitar Hero controllers were slammed repeatedly on the ground, he threw his Xbox out the window, he cracked his cell phone in half, and he ripped his bed sheets. During all this, I assumed he was just blowing off steam, not realizing he was breaking all his stuff. I had left the room during all this. In a war zone, he stood in the middle of the room, crying and drinking laundry detergent, yelling about wanting to die and how he took a bottle of Advil after breaking everything. In the meantime, he ran and grabbed shards of broken glass and plastic from his computer monitor and started cutting his wrists. We re-entered the room to find him bleeding and drinking detergent. As soon as the cops and paramedics arrived, charcoal was fed to him to keep him from dying from detergent. He left that night. The last thing he said to me was, Goodbye, Jay. Sorry about ruining your birthday. I needed a new roommate after he left, so I invited one of the guys across the hall to live with me. He accepted, and the RD agreed, and within two weeks he was in his new apartment. We became fast friends. Then he begins to tell me how Eduardo still texts him. Apparently, he still texts everyone in my room. I don't mind, because who am I to judge? It was hard to make friends with the people around us since Eduardo was a noisy, uncommunicative person. I always wanted to make friends with the people around us, but Eduardo made it much harder. In his mind, if they were his friends, then they couldn't be mine. I suppose I acted as an abused wife in retrospect. As a result of him being such a jerk, I sat quietly in my room playing video games, afraid to interact with people for fear of waking him up. After Bill introduced me to the neighbors, we became good friends. Once these friendships blossomed, they began to confess to me that Eduardo was not only still texting them but also becoming increasingly angry towards me. As he texted them, he admitted he'd made some mistakes and wished he could come back. It was at this point that he texted Bill and said, Hey, man, I'm coming up. It was at this point that I decided enough was enough. I called him since I still had his phone number saved on my phone and flat out told him not to come into my room. Because he was a downright horrible person, I would not let him stay in the room longer than it took for him to get the fridge he left behind that survived his episode. He was welcome to come and get his stuff that had survived his episode. The guy flipped out. He started screaming into the phone about how I was the greasiest slime ball he'd ever encountered. I hung up. He tried to call and text me, but I ignored everything. At this point, 
he began commenting on everything I'd ever done on Facebook. Hundreds of notifications, all with the same word, faggot. After that, Bill receives a text message saying, dude, fuck Jay. He won't say no after this. He asks Eduardo what he means, and Eduardo replies, I've got the keys to my father's gun case. I'll see you soon. The police station was the fastest place I've ever run to. After I explained the situation, they called a cop to speak to his parents and him. The cops got to his house. He was getting in the car with his dad's shotgun under the passenger's seat. They assured me that nothing was going to happen. The police came and my family and Eduardo's mother met with us at the school. She pleaded that Eduardo needed help and if I had him arrested, he could never change. As my parents kept urging me to press charges, I told them I wouldn't if Eduardo got help. Once again, everything was fine for about seven days until Halloween. As part of my job on campus, I cannot go out partying. My job is to check ID cards between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. to make sure everyone who enters lives there. I was told that two troopers would join me and my work partner because the drunken shenanigans on Halloween tend to get more rowdy than two students could handle. Those kids look pretty badass, so I checked their ID cards all night. A few hours later, around 3 a.m., one of the officers pulled me aside and told me he had something to tell me. It turns out that they were there that evening to search for Eduardo. Apparently, kids in costumes are harder to identify. How did I not know that? The officer told me that they had found him on campus around 2 a.m. He had been hiding at the dorm building's service entrance. It was a knife he was carrying, so this time I wasn't so lenient and I filed charges. Among other things, he now cannot be within two miles of the school campus, essentially making him unable to be in town. I still vividly remember every detail, even though it has been about four years since the incident. Prepare yourself for the chilling tale of the creepy roommate. Witness the haunting presence that hides behind closed doors. Will you survive this bone-chilling encounter? It was my freshman year at the University of Alabama. I had gotten my roommate's information a few weeks in advance, and his name was Brandon. This was back in 2013. We had been in contact in the weeks before classes would start. However, due to family-related reasons, Brandon had to switch to a different school right before classes even began. So for the first weekend, as everyone else was meeting their roommates, I was unpacking alone, still not yet assigned a replacement roommate. I did meet some of the other kids on my floor, though. They were nice. Then that Sunday night, my roommate arrived. He was walking through the dorm hall with a backpack, looking confused, and I asked him if he had just been transferred into this building, and he said yes. I asked him if he was in dorm number five. That wasn't the actual number in my room. I'm just using that for the story. But he said yes, that was his room. So I shook his hand, gave him my name, and told him I was his roommate. He told me his name was Robert, but to call him Bob. Unusual. I'd never met someone named Robert who preferred to be called Bob. I led Bob to the dorm, which I had already decorated and furnished on my side. His side was still empty. He plopped his backpack on his bed and looked at me and smiled for a bit, then said in a slight Turkish accent that he didn't have all this stuff yet. He opened his backpack and pulled out a sheet, which he threw over his bed. Since it was already past nine and tomorrow was the first day of class, Bob and I just sat on our respective beds, chatting. I tried to read his vibe at first, as you do when meeting a new person, let alone your roommate. I couldn't really get a good read on him, though he seemed a little quieter. He had this very deep voice and maybe a slightly awkward vibe to him, but I was purposely not judging because people can be nervous when meeting other people for the first time. 
Anyway, eventually, after talking for a bit, Bob just laid flat on the bed with a sheet on it and used his backpack as a pillow. It looked incredibly uncomfortable. I had no idea how or why he was doing that. I offered him a pillow and he accepted it. I eventually fell asleep past 10 and do you ever wake up to something but don't know what it was? That happened to me that night. I was confused about why I woke up because I didn't hear anything. But that was the freaky thing. It was dead silent in there, not even the sound of Bob breathing. I flipped to my side and screamed at the tall figure looming over my bedside. I came to the realization that it was Bob after he started apologizing and said that he was just going to the bathroom. My heart was beating like it was running a marathon. I couldn't even think to ask him why he was standing over my bed like that if he was just going to the bathroom. He apologized again as he went back to his bed. I told him it was okay. Needless to say, I was wide awake after that. I slept on my side with my back to him the rest of the night, though, trying to avoid the uncomfortableness. The next morning, I woke up to my alarm and I saw Bob still laying in his bed, likely pretending to be sleeping. I went through my bag to get my books and such, and I had this feeling in my gut that something had moved in my bag, like it had gone through. I looked up at Bob again, and he was still allegedly sleeping. I decided to take a couple of my more valuable things and throw them in my backpack that I took to class. In class, I emailed the housing department and then submitted a room change request online, stating that my roommate made me uncomfortable. After class that day, I returned to my dorm and was confused to notice the door was being held open with a door stopper. I noticed Bob had a big duffel bag on his bed now. I guessed he was unpacking. I laid in bed on my laptop and eventually Bob came in. He greeted me and went to his bed where he took his duffel bag and put it under the bed and he literally just looked at me with this empty expression. I pretended to not really notice, but his weirdness was really bothering me. I finally looked back at him with a non-friendly expression, and he gave me a slight nod. Then he climbed into his bed and just laid there on his phone. Eventually, I went out to the dining hall for dinner. When I came back, Bob was still there. I didn't know what his deal was, if he ever leave the dorm or what. I asked him if he had class that day. He said yes, but just one. That night, after turning the lights off, I noticed Bob leaning on the wall in his bed, facing me on his phone. I constantly felt like he was looking at me. I was anxious to get a response from the housing department, so I checked my email and saw they responded. But it wasn't the response I was hoping for. The lady who emailed me back expressed confusion over my request, stating that my replacement roommate had not yet been assigned and that there should be no one else in the room with me. I looked at Bob, who looked back at me. I was about to ask him if he had his key to the room on him. I didn't ask that, though. I put my laptop and other belongings in my backpack and duffel bag as he just watched. He didn't say anything and I think he knew that I knew. I left the room without saying anything, went to a safe place, and called campus police to report him. By the time they arrived at the dorms, Bob, or whatever his real name was, was gone, along with his little bit of stuff. I found out that night that he stole some clothes from me, my iPhone charger, and some of the food I stored in my closet. As for what he was doing, watching me sleep, I could only imagine he was making sure I was asleep before going through my stuff. I had a completely random, possibly homeless person in my room for basically the entire 24 hours. My real roommate moved in two days later. Feel an eerie presence in the room. Explore the enigma behind the supernatural occurrences as we unravel the mysteries of a dorm room plagued by malevolent forces. Enter, if you dare. I got along fine with my college roommate, Stacy. She was a messy one sometimes, but other than that, 
we had no problems. We'd lend each other stuff all the time. At our school, we had bunk beds, which I think were kind of unusual in college dorms. I was on the top bunk because I was the lighter sleeper and Stacy was always getting up in the middle of the night, so she'd definitely be waking me up if I were on the bottom. There was this one night that still sticks with me to this day, only because I don't really know how to logically explain it. Stacy and I were in our room studying. I was at my desk and she was in her bed. I had a big presentation the next day for one of my classes, so I was just going over my talking points again. In fact, I practiced them with Stacy a few times and she acted as my audience, then asked questions afterwards. She told me I could borrow one of her tops tomorrow if I needed it for my presentation as I didn't have any nice, formal kinds of tops with me at school. After helping me review, She went back to her studying for a little more, then she went to sleep. I wasn't done studying, but as a courtesy, I turned off my desk lamp and went up to my bunk and kept studying there on my laptop. Stacy would snore sometimes, so when she started snoring, I knew she was asleep. I continued my studying and rehearsing for another half hour to an hour before closing my laptop screen, putting it at the end of my bed, and then going to sleep. I woke up at like 5 a.m. when light was just barely starting to creep into the almost pitch black room through the windows. I heard Stacy down below me walking around. I groggily said Stacy's name and she answered with MHMH. I asked her if I could still borrow a nice top to wear for my presentation later that day. She went out again and I heard her open her closet door. I said thanks. I looked down at her and saw her bent over in the closet. Then she got out and waved at me as she went to leave the dorm. The sound of the door closing snapped me out of my day just a bit more. I remember grabbing my phone to check the time and just to naturally check for any notifications. It was around 5 a.m. I wondered where Stacy could have been going. Most likely the bathroom, like she often would in the middle of the night. The waving was just a bit unusual, though. But then I heard a snore from below me in the lower bunk. At first, I thought I had imagined it. Like, how could that be possible? I peered my head over the edge of the top bunk and there was Stacy under the sheets. Did I just dream of seeing Stacy in her closet? No, because I looked at the closet door and it was still open. I quickly hurried to the door to the room and went out to look into the hallway on both sides. There wasn't a soul in sight, but it had been at least five minutes since I heard the door shut. I shook Stacy awake and told her someone was just in our room. It took a few moments for her to fully wake up and snap to reality, which she then showed major concern for and rushed to check her closet for anything stolen. Nothing was stolen, though. I still... To this day, don't know who that was or how she got in. I reported it to the university police, but their investigation and review of the camera in the lobby of the building turned up nothing. But I know for a fact that it wasn't a hallucination or dream. Beware the terrifying sleepwalker. As darkness descends, witness the haunting steps of a sleepwalker possessed by the unknown. Can you handle the nightmare within? As a junior in college, I lived on campus in a suite. It was half of my friend group in the suite and we had a common room and kitchenette. Cody, who had been in the suite with us, moved off campus to live with his friend. The school automatically assigned us Rodney, another friend of Cody's. I thought he was normal enough. He had blonde, short hair, a beard, almost no eyebrows, and he was really tall medium build, but like six feet four. He was right next to my room. Having our own rooms, we were four in the suite. Rodney seemed to keep to himself the first few days until one day I came back from class and he was sitting in the living room talking. He told me he had parasomnia. It's why he's here from his previous dorm. 
When he explained that it's a sleep disorder, he said he might talk or yell in his sleep because of night terrors, and he wanted to make sure everyone in the suite knew about it so that we wouldn't feel uncomfortable. In truth, that was the first conversation I had with him, and it made me feel really uncomfortable. As much as I hoped to get to know him, I didn't get why he thought it needed to tell me about that. I texted them in the dorm group chat we made, with Cody still in it, if Rodney had told them about his sleep disorder yet. All said no, followed by laughter and confusion. We hung out in the common room when my other two suite mates got back and talked about how Rodney's sleep disorder might have contributed to his transfer from his previous room. Rodney walked in and walked right past us. After giving us a slight SUP, he went to his room and shut the door. We were talking about him that evening. That night, I heard a knock on my door. When I asked who it was and got no reply, I thought to myself, what if it was Rodney? The next morning, I texted my friends asking if they had knocked on my door last night. Cody was laughing at all of this. I was already freaked out and hoping this wouldn't be something I have to deal with on a regular basis. A few nights later, it got worse. It was midnight. I was already awake, I checked my phone, and it read 2 a.m. I heard footsteps outside in the hallway, and again, a knock at my door. This time, I didn't answer, I knew it was Rodney. Obviously a heavy sleepwalker. I texted in the group chat again at 2 o'clock, telling them it just happened again. They didn't respond until morning. Rodney's room was right next to mine, so I knocked on his door and asked him if it had been him knocking on my door that night. When I asked him if he had any recollection of doing it, he told me he didn't remember it, but then apologized because he didn't mention sleepwalking was part of his parasomnia. Despite him telling me it was completely harmless, I didn't view it as completely harmless if it was freaking me out in the middle of the night. A certain amount of time passed before I realized it. Probably less than four days. There hadn't been any other knocks on the door in the middle of the night, which was good, but this story wouldn't be told without something else happening. I woke up to noise in my room. Rodney was sitting in a corner of the dark room, staring at the wall, muttering to himself. I said his name, and he turned to me, saying, open the door. He looked in my direction, but it didn't seem like he was looking at me. I saw a smile on his face, and I heard what sounded like a small laugh as he walked out of the room. I didn't know if I should wake him up or not, I know nothing about sleepwalking or sleep disorders. I grabbed my phone and was about to text my friends when I heard a deafening bang outside, followed by Rodney screaming, open the door. I grabbed my phone and was about to text my friends, but Rodney's voice screamed at me. Rodney was screaming like a maniac. I ran to the common area and saw him smashing his fists on the door of our sweet mate. I started shaking him. When my two friends came out of their rooms, we all began shaking Rodney until he stopped, looked at all three of us, and said, I'm sorry, guys, before going into his room and locking the door. A neighboring room must have called campus police because they showed up at our door. We had to tell them the truth. Rodney spoke with them for a while, then returned to his room. I ensured that I did not leave my room unlocked again that night. The next day, Rodney was gone without a trace of his existence. I have no idea what sleepwalking is, but that didn't seem to be sleepwalking to me. It is unclear as to what was or is going on in that man's head, but he needs to seek assistance. As the darkness recedes, the horrors persist. Subscribe to Terrifying Tales TV and be the first to experience more bone-chilling stories, nightmares that will haunt your every thought. Don't miss out on future terrors.